The Jack Benny Program, presented by... Let that famous chant remind you that Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. L-S-M-F-T. 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 Sure thing. That's right. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. At 49, American. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Yes, the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. That's right. L-S-M-F-T. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. The finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. <laughs> From Palm Springs, California, the Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I recite a little poem? Last Thursday was St. Valentine's Day, the day when love is in bloom. It's also Jack Benny's birthday. Nobody leave this room. <laughs> Hello, folks. Thank you. Thank you. And, Don, let me tell you something. I'm very proud of the fact that I was born in February, the same month as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Just think, Washington, Lincoln, and Benny... The first big three. <laughs> George, Abe, and Jack. And you know, Don, it was just a stroke of luck that I arrived in February. I was supposed to be born in March. In March? Well, then how come you were born in February? Well, the stork was flying south for the winter, and he didn't want to come back just for me. <laughs> it's a long trip, you know. Well, anyway, Jack, congratulations on passing another milestone. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, how old are you now? Thirty-seven. And now, ladies and gentlemen... 37? Why, Jack, you said you were 37 last year. And now, ladies and gentlemen... And the year before. And now, ladies and gentlemen... And the year before that, you said you were 37. Don, when you're happy with something, why leave it? <laughs> anyway, a lot you care. You didn't even come to my birthday party. Well, I'm very sorry, Jack. I got your invitation, but I had to go back to Los Angeles. Oh. And, Jack, there was one thing about the invitation I didn't quite understand. What was that, Don? Well, it said, uh, you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday, 15, 34, 11. What do those numbers mean? They're the sizes of my shirts, underwear, and socks. <laughs> I knew... I knew you'd want to bring something. <laughs> I used to put RSVP, and what did I get? Nothing. <laughs> so from now on, I'm not taking it. Hello, any... Jack. How are you, Don? Oh, hello, hello, Mary. Mary. Hello. <laughs> Say, Mary, uh, Don and I were just talking about my birthday party. We had a lot of fun, didn't we? Yeah, you should have been there, Don. We played charades and post office and spin the bottle. Yeah. And then we played blind man's buff. <laughs> And you should have seen Jack when he was it. Oh, uh, what'd he do, Mary? Tie a handkerchief around his eyes? No, he just turned out the lights. He figured he'd have fun and save money at the same time. <laughs> same time. Your sister Babe would have fit in Blind Man's Buck. <laughs> <laughs> then about 11 o'clock, we all got hungry, so Rochester brought in Jack's birthday cake. Oh, birthday cake, huh? How'd it taste? I don't know. By the time we took all the candles off it, I wasn't hungry anymore. <laughs> Mary, just be glad that I sent you an invitation to my party, that's all. Say, Jack, I meant to ask you about that invitation. It said, uh, you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday. S.O.S. What did S.O.S. mean? Short on socks. <laughs> I always have to remind you. Hmm. I always have to remind... Oh, for heaven's sake, that's the cue for Phil Harris. He's not even here yet. Well, maybe he's at the Lone Palm getting potted. <laughs> 
don't care. I don't care where he is. We've got to get on with the show. Mary, you take his lines. Oh, Jack, I can't read Phil's lines. Mary, we can't hold up the show. Now, go ahead and read Phil's part. I'll give you the cue again. Short on socks. Okay, folks, here's your favorite pixie. Harris is here, and he's right from Dixie. Appreciate me. Appreciate me. <laughs> Phil, I wish you'd stop coming in here with those corny entrances. And another hey, thing... Hey, Jackson, Jackson, I got a joke that'll murder you. Ask me what the wallpaper said to the wall. Phil. Go ahead, ask me. All right, Phil. What did the wallpaper say to the wall? You may be plastered, but I'll stick to you anyway. Ha, ha, ha! You're like a strong theater seat You never let the audience down Love it, love it, love it <laughs> Now, Phil, the next time Ladies you... and gentlemen For the benefit of those who tuned in late The part of Phil Harris is being played by Mary Livingston <laughs> Well, it's no use, Mary Even you can't say those kind of jokes Let's have a song from Larry Stevens While we're waiting for Phil Oh, Larry Here I am, Mr. Benny Say, Mr. Benny, I want to thank you for inviting me to your party. I sure had a good time. At my party? Larry, I didn't see you there. When'd you come in? When you were playing Blind Man's Buff. Oh, oh, did I say hello to you? No, but you kissed me twice. <laughs> oh. Well, kid, when you get a little older and grow a beard, I won't make that mistake. Now, <laughs> now let's have a song, Larry. Okay. By the way, Mr. Benny, there was one thing I didn't understand about that invitation you sent me. What was that, kid? Well, it said you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday. G-T-D-T-K-W-I-N. What does that mean? Go to Desmond's. They know what I need. <laughs> Sing, kid. And thanks for the bicycle clip. It was just my size, by the way. Thank you very, very much. Outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. It doesn't show signs of stopping, and I brought some corn for popping. The lights are turned way down low. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. When we finally kiss goodnight How oh, I'll hate going out in the storm But if you'll really hold me tight All the way home I'll be warm Oh, the fire is slowly dying And my dear, we're still goodbye But as long as you love me so Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow the snowman in the yard is frozen hard He's a sorry sight to see If he had a brain, he'd complain Betty wishes he were me Oh, the fire is slowly dying And my dear, we're still goodbye But as long as you love me so Let it snow, let it snow. That, um, that was Larry Stevens singing Let It Snow. The title is really Let It Snow, Let It Snow. You're supposed to say it twice. But we have a very long show, and if we take up too much time, the tobacco auctioneer at the end of the program will have to hurry, and you won't be able to understand a thing he said. <laughs> so in view of the fact that we're trying to save time, I had to change the title of Larry's song from Let It Snow, Let It Snow, to Just Let It Snow. <laughs> And uh, now, folks... That line was originally ladies and gentlemen, but the genius cut it down to folks. Yes, yes, we save wherever we can. Now, that's why I changed the title of Larry's song... So... Okay, folks, here's your favorite pixie. Harris is here, and he's right from Dixie. <laughs> appreciate me, appreciate me, you lovely son, Sam, <laughs> Yes, sir. Well... 
Yes, Phil, sir. We, we couldn't wait for you any longer, so Mary did your routine. Now go sit down. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Jackson. I got a joke that'll murder you. Ask me what the wallpaper said to the wall. Phil, Mary did that joke. I don't care who did it. Go on, ask me what the wallpaper said to the wall. <laughs> All right, Phil, we'll do it again. What did the wallpaper say to the wall? You might be a little cracked, but I got designs on you. <laughs> They ought to put a slot in your head Because your brains are like money in the bank <laughs> Love it, love it, love it yes. What kind of language is that? I think... How do you like that? Uh, ladies and gentlemen For the benefit of those who tuned in late Aren't you glad you're you? <laughs> Phil Phil, you're supposed to do what we rehearse And not bring in any new stuff I got designs on you. Where'd you get that joke? Well, I hired myself a writer, Jackson. I found him right here in Palm Springs. A writer? Yeah, he lives right over here on the Indian Reservation. Phil, I know Palm Springs is crowded, but why is he living on... No, I can't ask him. <laughs> Mary, Mary, you do it. Okay, Phil. Phil, I know Palm Springs is crowded, but why is he living on an Indian Reservation? Because he's an Indian. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Phil, I don't know, I don't know where you find him, but I never heard of an Indian writer. Well, I, I think you're wrong, Jack. Some Indians are very good writers. Sure, Jackson, this guy I've got not only writes jokes, but he writes commercials. What? Go ahead, Don, read him the one my writer gave you. Okay. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Me, like em, lucky strike. Me, send em, smoke signals. L.S., M.F.T., yum. L.S., M.F.T., yum. Tium. Yes, sir. How? You betcha. Lucky strike, heap round, heap firm, heap fully packed, heap free and easy on the draw. Don. Me, heap big, Indian chief. You big heap, that's all. <laughs> Ugh. What's that? Shh, shh. Signal come from reservation. It say... With Sioux Indian who know tobacco best, it's lucky Sioux to one. Oh, is that Sioux? Well. Now, my good friend, L.A. Speed, rain in face. Hiawatha, Minnetonka, Tippy Tippy, Cucamonga, Tomahawk, Wiggy, Wami, Fat for Pussy, Soto, Iroquois. <laughs> Don? Don, that was very good. Very good. Now, let's... What are those horses' hoofs? Commercial finish. Take them plug back to reservation. <laughs> oh, me catch them on. And now, folks... Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of you Indians who tuned in late, my face is red, too. <laughs> this is the craziest program we've done yet. What are we aiming at? 4.30. <laughs> Seven thirty in the east. Say, yeah. hey, Jackson, we better start getting sharper. We'll hear about it at five thirty. You know that when Fred Allen comes on. Phil, when you mention Fred Allen on this program, you must be closer to retirement than I think you are. <laughs> I heard his program last week. While he was telling a joke, a long word got stuck in his nose sideways, and he held up the show for five minutes. <laughs> Don't tell me about Alan. Oh, Jack, you're just mad because his picture is better than yours. Mary, that's no comparison. Everybody's picture is better than mine. <laughs> now, let's forget about that ill win from Alan's Alan. Sign for a band number. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, boys, filibuster. <laughs> Thank you. 
That, uh, that was Sweetheart, played by Phil Harris and his sweetest music this side of Roger Stable's orchestra. <laughs> And that's a, uh... For the benefit of those horses who tuned in late, Roger's stable is a stable owned by Roger's. <laughs> Roger. I mean, thank you. Now, come on. Come on, kids. Let's keep the show moving. Well, what's the hurry, Jackson? Well, uh, I'm having some important people over for dinner tonight, and I don't want to be late. See, Rochester's calling for me. By the way, Mary, remind me to pick up some salami on the way home, will you? <laughs> okay. Oh, Jack, I meant to ask you about Rochester. Is it true that he was lost for two days out on the ocean? Yes. Uh, yeah, he was out in a boat near Catalina. Yeah, I read about it, Jackson. I heard it on the radio, too. Yeah. Funny thing. I, I didn't know anything about it until it was all over. You didn't? No. When I found out about it last Wednesday, I was home taking my violin lesson. You know, I still have my music teacher, Professor LeBlanc. Anyway, here's what happened. No, no, Monsieur Benny. Once more, you have made this same mistake. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Professor LeBlanc. Shall I do it again? Yes. And this time, please, take off your gloves. <laughs> well, the strings are cold. <laughs> All right. Now come in. No, no, mon de conscience sacré bleu, Monsieur Benny, please tell me something. How long have you been playing the violin? Well, ever since I can remember, I was a child prodigy. I do not believe it. That I was a prodigy? No, that you were a child. <laughs> now, take it again, please. Okay. <laughs> One and two and three and four and... Play it bright and not so dull, sir. This what gave me my ulcer. <laughs> this time soft, just like a pillow. What have I done to Patrillo? Uh, how was that? Very good. Here. Oh, boy, another gold star. <laughs> You know, Professor, someday I may be a great violinist. You should live so long, and you already did. <laughs> now, listen. Mm, child prodigy. Well, I was. My father made me start playing the violin when I was seven. Oh, so your father made you take up the violin? Yes. And where is your father now? In Florida. The coward. <laughs> And now, Monsieur Benny, I guess the hour is up. No, no, it isn't, Professor. When we started the lesson, I set the alarm clock. It'll ring when the hour is up. All right. For this, for this, I left Lockheed. <laughs> now, one and two and three and four and... <laughs> well, how do you like that? He didn't even wait for me to pay him. <laughs> oh, well. I wonder if I should keep practicing. No, no, I can't stand it anymore. Oh, gee, I wish I hadn't told Rochester he could have a couple of days off. He does everything for me. So tired of sleeping with my clothes on. <laughs> well, I guess I'll turn on the radio. I'm the Whistler. I walk by night. <laughs> Gee, that whistler scares me. And I've got such a nice painting of his mother. <laughs> I'll try and get something else. Ladies and gentlemen, are you nearsighted? When you're having breakfast, do you get too close to your hotcakes? Do you get molasses on your glasses? Do you suffer from middle-aged spread? Do your hips try to hurdle your girdle? Hmm? If you suffer from these or any other ailments, 
Why not try sympathy soothing syrup? Remember, sympathy spelled backwards is your tapamas. Y H T A P M Y S. Yes, yes, you tap a miss. Yes, yes, you tap a miss. Yes, yes, you tap a miss. Drive your blues away. <laughs> he, he must have a new quartet there. <laughs> and now, folks, here is our you tap a miss news reporter with a special item. Ladies and gentlemen, Rochester Van Jones, who has been adrift in the Pacific Ocean for the last two days, has been found by the Coast Guard and towed into port. What? Rochester is the butler of that famous comedian, Jack Bentley. That's Benny. <laughs> Our quartet will now sing their version of that new song hit, Yes, We Have No Bananas, Butter, or Sugar. I don't want to hear that. Oh, my goodness, Rochester adrift in the Pacific. I didn't even know he was on a boat. Well, thank heaven he's safe. When he gets home, I'm going to... Maybe that's him. Hello? Long distance call for Jack Bentley. That's Benny. <laughs> I'll take it. Very well. Hello? Hello? Hello, is this Rochester? You were expecting maybe ship work, Kelly? <laughs> Rochester, I just heard about you being in the ocean for two days. How are you? Salty! <laughs> I know, I know, but tell me what happened. Well, boss, me and my friend Sam were about 20 miles off Catalina when we developed motor trouble. And you know I can't swim. Uh-huh. Then suddenly a big wave swept me overboard and I landed right next to a vicious-looking shark. So I got back to the boat fast... Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. You just said you couldn't swim. I didn't think I could run on water either, but I did. <laughs> Well, well, what happened then? Well, when we weren't rescued after the first day, we realized we were in a tough spot. So we started sending out messages in bottles. What did the messages say? Send more bottles. <laughs> Rochester, I hope you weren't drinking out there. Oh, no, boss. No, sir. But after the second day, we sure got hungry. And fortunately, a bird landed on back of the boat. A bird? Good. So I picked up my rifle, took aim, and I... Rifle? Rochester, you wouldn't shoot a poor little bird. No, I just wanted to frighten her enough to lay an egg. <laughs> Did you frighten her? Did I? She laid two eggs, three strips of bacon. <laughs> Rochester, don't be ridiculous. A bird can't lay bacon. Boss, when you got a gun in your face, you find out you got talent you never knew you had. <laughs> Never mind that. Now, tell me, how did you get back to shore? Well, the uh, Coast Guard finally found us and towed us into the harbor. Well, I'm glad it came out all right. It certainly was an unusual experience. It sure was. <laughs> Rochester, what are you laughing at? It's the first time I ever lost a weekend on water. <laughs> well, I thought. Anyway, Rochester, I'm glad you're safe, and hurry out here to Palm Springs. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well done. There you are. That's how I found out about Rochester. Ladies and gentlemen, this is American Brotherhood Week. Brotherhood. There's much more to it than the word itself implies. Many of us feel that we are practicing it if we have consideration and respect for our immediate circle of friends. Well, that's not enough. We should have it for all people everywhere. The color of a man's skin and the church he goes to is a mighty poor yardstick to use in measuring his character. And to have a contempt for an entire race because of color or creed is unthinkable. If you want to know how it feels, think back to when the Germans and the Japanese thought themselves superior races 
and said that all Americans were decadent, criminal, and stupid. Our anger and indignation flared at the thought of Americans being called decadent, criminal, and stupid. And yet, if we tolerate racial and religious discrimination, we are. I think I saw brotherhood at its best when I was overseas during the war. When men are fighting for their lives and the lives of their fellows, racial and religious issues are relegated to their proper place of unimportance. I never heard a wounded man complain about being carried back to a field hospital by a Negro or ask whether the blood plasma he was getting was Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. You know, a bullet is a very democratic thing. So let's remember and perpetuate these battlefield lessons and carry them through our lives to make a better world. There is a verse in the song, America the Beautiful, that should mean a lot to all of us. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea and crown thy good with brotherhood. That is our heritage. Let's live up to it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here is my good friend, L.A. Speed Riggs. A man goes by what he knows. Here's what Mr. William Lee Branch, independent tobacco auctioneer of Winterville, North Carolina, said. Sure, I smoke Luckies. Been smoking them for 18 years. Any tobacco man will tell you that the quality of a cigarette depends on the quality of the tobacco that goes into it. And I know from long experience that Lucky Strike buys fine quality tobacco. Quote, I know from long experience that Lucky Strike buys fine quality tobacco. Unquote. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. So for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's programmer, Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. L.A. Forty. And Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. At 49, out of 49, American. And this is Basil Risedale speaking for Lucky Strike. L.S.M.F.T. 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 In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Well, Jack, another program's over. Yep, another program and another birthday. Just think, Mary, next year at this time, I'll be 39. 39? Jack, you said this year you were 37. Oh, yes, yes, I'll be 38. I gotta watch that. <laughs> Good night, Paul. <laughs> this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Jack Benny Program. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. At 49, American. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. L-S-M-F-T. 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 Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So, for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Excuse me, this is Kenny Delmar. Excuse me, I have a special announcement to make. Herbert Tides and Cigarettes are back. 
Good news for those who prefer a cork tip cigarette. Herbert Tyden is back, and there's something about them you like. Herbert Tyden is back after being made only for the armed forces. Yes, Herbert Tyden is back. That cork tip cigarette, Herbert Tyden, available now for you. Yes, Herbert Tyden is back, and remember, there's something about them you like. There's something about them you like. This is Kenny Delmar. I trust you will welcome home Herbert Tyden. There's something about them you like. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to last night and out to Jack Benny's house where the whole gang has gathered for rehearsal. Rochester, has everybody arrived for rehearsal? Yes, sir. They're all in the library. Good. Well, I'm ready. Yes, sir. Mr. Jack Benny, everybody rise. <laughs> the first rehearsal of the 26th program of the Lucky Strike series is now in session. Good evening, Miss Livingston. Uh, good evening, Mr. Benny. Good evening, Mr. Wilson. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Uh, good evening, Mr. Harris. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Hey, what's happened since I went away? <laughs> Another outburst like that, and I'll have the room cleared. <laughs> Now, raise your right hands and repeat after me. Mr. Harris, it's your other hand. <laughs> now, repeat after me. I do solemnly swear... I, I do solemnly swear, swear... That I will not divulge or repeat... That I will not divulge or repeat... Any routines, ideas, or jokes herein contained... Any routines, ideas, or jokes herein contained... And if I do, may I be farmed out to life can be beautiful. <laughs> And if I do, may I be farmed out so life can be beautiful. You may all be seated. Uh, rehearsal is now in session. And now to facilitate the reading of the script, will everybody please remove their paper clips? Good. Rochester, collect them, count them, and straighten the bent line. Yes, sir. We will now commence the rehearsal with the opening introduction by Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, if you please. Thank you. I beg your pardon, Mr. Benny. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Wilson. What is it, Mr. Harris? Well, I'd like to propose an amendment to joke four on page six. Why? Because it stinks. <laughs> I see. Mr. Harris has expressed an opinion that joke four on page six has an aromatic quality which is not pleasant. <laughs> We will take a vote. Miss Livingston? I agree. Mr. Wilson? I agree. Mr. Day? I can't tell. I have a cold. <laughs> Motion passed. And now we will proceed Oh, with... Jack, for heaven's sake, this is silly. What? Why do we have to go through this every time we have a rehearsal? Why can't we rehearse like we used because to? Because everybody took advantage of it. You come in late, you wouldn't pay attention, you sat around reading newspapers instead of scripts. That's why. But, Jack, you can't rehearse this way. You've got to loosen up. After all, this is a comedy program. Ooh, what she said. <laughs> Dennis. Well, Libby's right, Jackson. We can't be funny when we're so formal and stiff. Phil, you're the only one that comes in stiff. <laughs> That's why we're rehearsing this way. Remember, I'm the star. I'm the star. I'm the star. <laughs> Quiet, Polly. Quiet, Polly. Quiet, Polly. Quiet, <laughs> Polly, if you don't keep quiet, I'm going to... You know what. Oh, Jack, not again. What does he do, Livy? Every time the Polly talks back to him, he takes her out of the cage, opens the front door, and hands her a road map to Capistrano. <laughs> Mary. That's the only parrot registered with the automobile club. <laughs> Never mind. Let's get started with the rehearsal. There's no... There's, uh, now, here's the way the show will run. We'll do our usual opening spot, a band number, 
And then Dennis' songs... Sandwiches, we... hard-boiled eggs, and Coca-Cola. Get your sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and Coca-Cola here. Oh, yes. I'll have a roast beef. Here you are. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll... Uh... Hard-boiled eggs, cooked fresh this morning, roast beef sandwiches. I'll have a hard-boiled egg. Here you are. Thank you. And now we'll... Uh... Uh, may I have a paper napkin, please? Yes, ma'am. Here you are. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll... Uh... Will you have a sandwich, Mr. Day? Yes, please. Here you are. Hmm. <laughs> I'll have to re-educate this kid. He got his food free in the Navy. <laughs> And now we'll go... Let's to... call for sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and Coca-Cola. Eggs and Coca-Cola! Eggs and Coca-Cola! All right, kids, we'll start the rehearsal with the introduction. No, no, we better... Oh, Jack, let's start somewhere so we can get through. We're all going to the movies. Yeah, Jackson, we're going down to see that new picture, The Road to Utopia. Oh, yeah. Say, maybe I'll go with you. I'd like to see what Crosby looks like with his collar open. <laughs> anyway, kids, we can't go to laughter uh, rehearsal. I don't know what you want to go to the movies for anyway. There hasn't been a good picture since the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> Quiet, Polly. You didn't even see it. Maybe Walter Pigeon told her. Yeah, yeah, Walter Pigeon. He flies by here every day. <laughs> now, listen, kid, let's get one thing straight. My rehearsals are more important than going to the movies. I'm sick of the movies anyway. Oh, Jack, you always hate the movies this time of the year because you never win the Academy Award. Mary, that has nothing to do with it. Comedy pictures get very little consideration. I found out one thing. To win an Academy Award, you got to do a picture with absolutely no laughs. Well, your darn one last near made it. <laughs> I think you got the idea. Don't mind when you ball up a lousy gag, but that was such a good one. <laughs> anyway, my next picture will... Sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and Alabama pennants. Alabama pennants? Yeah, we have them left over from the Rose Bowl game. Rochester, save those. Alabama may be out here again. Okay. Boy, did I take a beating on those. I tried everything. I even had Rochester sitting on a bale of cotton. Now, come on, kid. Let's get going with this rehearsal. Don, take it from oh, the... Oh, uh, Jack, Jack, I've been looking all through the script, and I don't see any place where I do a commercial. Oh, oh, that. Well, Don, I got a big surprise for you, and it'll be a terrific on our show. Uh, what is it, Jack? Well, get this, kid. Now, Polly... Polly... Uh, now, Polly, what has Daddy been teaching you all week? No, no, Polly. No, 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 no. That, that you picked up yourself. Now, listen. L.S. M.F.T. L.S. MFT. Hard bar eggs. <laughs> no, no, no. Take it again, Polly. L S. L S. MFT. MFT. Now put them all together, and what have you got? Mother. <laughs> Polly, how can you be so dumb? Every week you listen to the radio, you hear the commercials. Now what do you hear? Poor Miriam. Poor Miriam. <laughs> Not bad. Now listen, Polly. Listen. Lucky strike. Means fine tobacco. Come on. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. LS, MFT. We're past that. I want it. Polly. <laughs> now look, Polly, listen. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So round. So firm. So firm. So fully packed. I bought eggs. <laughs> No, no. I got a good notion to yank you out of that cage and teach... Rock the pull it back, so free it easy on the drop. <laughs> uh, it works every time. Well, kids, that takes care of the commercial. If he teaches that bird how to sing, I'm back in the Navy. <laughs> well, as a warning to all of you, she's learning fast. Now, kids, let's rehearse the scene right after... Oh, you... Jack, why can't we rehearse tomorrow morning? It's getting late. We want to go to the movie. Well, all right. But, Dennis, before you go, run over your song. I'm going up to bed. So long, kids. I'll see you in the morning. Go on, Why? 
gather dance with me. It was just a ride on a train. That's all that it was. But oh, what it seemed to be. It was like a trip to the stars with Venus and Mars. Cause you were on the train with me And when I kissed you, darling It was more than just a thrill for me It was the promise, darling Of the thing that fate had will Rochester, please untie my shoes, will you? Your shoes? Yeah. I do it myself, but Benny's back and Lumbago's got him. <laughs> hey, did you hear that? Benny's back and Lumbago's got him. Hey, Rochester, do you think I should use that joke on my program tomorrow? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, that's all I need you for, Rochester. Good night. Good night, boy. <clears throat> Look what time it is. 8.30. That's funny. I'm not even sleepy. I think I'll sit up for a while and read a book. Let's see. Here's one. Clara Klingenpeel, Girl Bricklayer. <laughs> oh, I read that. Here's another one. I Married a Smudge Pot. <laughs> Gee, that was a hot one. I remember that one. Here's another one. You're darn one last near made it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I read that just a couple of minutes ago. I wonder if... Say, wait a minute. Here's a book I haven't read. I Stand Condemned. By Maximilian Q. Langley. Hmm, I stand condemned. Gee, that's an exciting title. I think I'll read this book. Chapter One. I stand condemned. I'm what you call an average citizen. I come from a little town in the Midwest. Yes, I'm married. I have a lovely wife. We have three fine boys and a dog. George, Frank, Harry, and Rover. <laughs> Harry is the dog. <laughs> My life, as the lives of most men, followed a course pointed out by the fickle finger of fate. Hmm, fickle finger of fate. Gee, this guy's a classy writer. Most stories start at the beginning, but my story begins at the end. I am occupying a cell in the death row at the state penitentiary. I'm innocent. I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me out of here. Oh, warden. Warden. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta let me out of here. I'm 
Innocent, do you hear? Innocent. In a few minutes, they're going to execute me. What time do I go to the chair? 5.30. Good. Then I won't have to listen to Fred Allen. <laughs> oh, what am I saying? Warden, I tell you, it wasn't my fault. I don't want to go to the electric chair. Now, now, calm down. Our barber's a little rushed today, so I'll shave your head myself. But what? Uh, sit still. I'll start with the scissors. Take it easy around the sideburns, please. <laughs> uh, yes, Manicure? No, no, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, on the house, you know. Oh, oh, manicure, please. Wait a minute. Wait, let me out of here. I don't want to go to the electric chair. I won't leave this room. I can't walk that last mile. Oh, you won't have to. We'll bring the electric chair in here. <laughs> what? We have a long cord, you know. Warden, <laughs> yeah. if you'll only listen to my story, I know you'll believe me. Oh, very well. What is your story? Well, Warden, it goes back a long, long time. I would have led a normal life except for the fickle finger of fate. The Warden listened to my story. I told him how I met the man who was responsible for my undoing. I was walking down the street. I just left my office and was going home to my three wonderful children, Manny, Moe, and Jack. <laughs> we had Manny and Jack and felt that we should have one Moe. <laughs> anyway, I was walking along when suddenly a figure stepped out of the shadow. <laughs> He was a small man with a round face. He reminded me somewhat of Peter Lorre. And when he spoke, his voice too reminded me of Peter Lorre. He tapped me on the shoulder and said, Pardon me, sir, but uh, may I trouble you for a match? A match? I'm sorry I don't have one, but I'll let you use my cigarette lighter. Thank you. You're very kind. Hey, you, come back with that lighter. Give me that. All right, all right. Here's your lighter. I thought you just wanted to light a cigarette. I do, but my cigarette is home. <laughs> oh, yeah? Then why were you running toward the railroad station? My home is in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburgh? Yes. I married a smudge pot. <laughs> smudge pot? Now, wait a minute. You were trying to steal my cigarette lighter. No, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I'd like to buy it. I'll give you $20,000 for it. $20,000? Well, I don't want to take advantage of you. I'll tell you what. I'll throw in an extra flint. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, here's the money. $20,000 bill. Well, so long, mister. I hope you enjoy the lighter. Oh, uh, uh, just a moment. I, I also admire that uh, necktie you are wearing. My necktie? <laughs> I know it sounds fantastic, but he bought my tie for $17,000. <laughs> and then he bought my shirt, my shoes, and my suit. And I gave him my last stitch of clothing, this mysterious stranger handed me $194,000 and two balloons. <laughs> Having no clothes, I blew up the balloons and danced my way home. <laughs> the next day, I met the little man for a second time. Again, he gave me fabulous prices for my clothes, and again, I danced my way home. On the third day, the same thing happened. I was not only getting richer, but I was dancing better. <laughs> Our daily meetings were more than a mere coincidence. A bond developed between us. Two weeks later, I was sitting in the kitchen having breakfast with my wife and my three lovely children, Anaheim, Azusa, and Cuca. <laughs> The little man had not yet come downstairs. Yes, he was living with us. 
Come on, children, finish your breakfast. That's right, children. Eat every bit of it. But, Dowdy, I'm tired of this silly old caviar. <laughs> why can't we have oatmeal like we used to? Because we're rich, that's why. Now, hurry up or you'll be late for school. Where's Junior? Oh, he's out in the backyard making mud pies out of butter. <laughs> Heaven's sake, doesn't he know he's going to ruin his mink overalls? Anyway, he's been out there long enough. Junior, Junior, get ready for school. Oh, Daddy, I don't want to go to that new school. I bought it and you'll go to it. <laughs> now, get ready. You know, darling, things just haven't been the same since that stranger came to live with us. He frightens me. There's something weird about him. You know, I've been feeling the same. Shh, quiet. Here he comes now. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. <laughs> Mad. <laughs> uh, sit down. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I'm late for breakfast, but I, I overslept. <laughs> I was out in a party last night. A party? Well, how do you feel this morning? <laughs> oh, well, have some tomato juice. <laughs> Yes, I'll get you some. Well, you know I envy you two. Oh, a beautiful home and lovely children. Haven't you any children? No. I married a smudge pot. Oh, then you have no children? No. But we are lousy with oranges. <laughs> oh. Uh, by the way, I, I don't feel I should live here any longer without paying you rent. How much do you want? Well, I'm no good at these things. Let's forget it. Oh, no, 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 I insist. Would a million dollars a week be enough? <laughs> well, with or without meals? <laughs> oh, uh, with meals. That'll be three dollars extra. <laughs> I'll be glad to pay for it. Glad! Things like this were happening every day. I had gone money mad. Money, money, money. My, life, my wife left me. And so did my three lovely children. Atchison, Topeka, and Irving. <laughs> they ran off with the Harvey girl. And I didn't care I had my money. I had accumulated millions of dollars, which I kept in my shoes. I was now 11 feet six. <laughs> The OPA to raise the ceiling. <laughs> One day, as I was sweeping some loose chains under the rug, he came in. Now cut that out! <laughs> Hello, my friend. I have a present for you. A brand new $10,000 bill. A $10,000 bill? Let me have it. Give it to me quick. I gotta have it. All right, all right. But be careful how you handle it. The ink is still wet. Don't worry. I'll... The ink is still wet. Wait a minute. You mean you've been printing this money yourself? Certainly doesn't everybody. <laughs> oh, so that's it. I must have been blind not to see through this whole scheme. My life is ruined. I lost my wife and my three lovely children. Sarah, Toga, and Trunk. <laughs> I thought I was rich. But I haven't got a tie or a shirt or a suit. All I got is money, 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 and all counterfeit. You've even got my cigarette lighter, and I, like a fool, threw in an extra flint. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd really pay $17,000 for a necktie? $22,000 for your button shoes? Now, wait a minute. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd give you $500 for a dinner when I could get the same thing at Ciro's for $400? <laughs> Ciro! Of course that money was counterfeit. And those balloons you gave me weren't any good either. They broke on the sunset bus and embarrassed me. <laughs> and for all this time, you've been nothing but a counterfeit. Well, what's the difference? We can still do business. I can print the money and 
You can get rid of it for Never, me. never, never. I'll kill you first. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill you. Get your hands up. My throat. Take them away. Don't kill me. I'll give you back your clothes. My clothes? What good are they now? You've had the pants short. <laughs> taken in. You even cut off the belt in the back. <laughs> Stop choking me. Why must I always die at the end? <laughs> Finish telling my story. The warden looked at me and said, It's 5.30. Shall we go? <laughs> yes. And so, as I walked through the little green door, I thought of my three lovely children. Fickle, finger, and face. <laughs> I stand condemned. <laughs> Gee, that was... What a swell book. That guy's a great writer. Fickle finger of fate. I gotta remember that. Jack will be back in just a minute. First is my good friend, F.D. E. Boone. At 49, American. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Yes, it takes fine tobacco to make a fine cigarette. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen present at the tobacco auctions can see just who buys what tobacco. They can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco means more real, deep-down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's program are Mr. F. E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. At 49, out of 49, American. And Mr. L. A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. This is Basil Risedale speaking for Lucky Strike. LSMFT. 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 Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday we'll be with you again broadcasting from the permanent Army Air Base at March Field. Well, Peter Laurie, I want to thank you very much for appearing on my program tonight. It's a pleasure to be here, Jack. I may not see you later, so I want to pay you for your performance right now. Here you are, $3,000. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Be careful how you handle it. The ink is still wet. (laughs) Good night, This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.